Well, I'm glad today that Pastor Andy is preaching, and I want to tell you why. Pastor Andy is one of the greatest students of the scriptures I've ever known, and I've been around for a few minutes. And one of the things I love about him is that he digs deep. He doesn't go so deep that you get lost in the, you know, 40,000 feet under the sea level. But he brings up riches and, 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 and rubies, if, if you will, uh, of truth and things that enlighten us and encourage us and inspire us and teach us. So I want you to stand with me this morning. I know you just got sat down. I want you to stand and give, give an ovation to the best youth pastor in the state of Alabama, bar none. Thank you, Pastor Andy. Thank you, Pastor. And as usual, Pastor said, take my time. So, <laughs> thank you, Billy. <laughs> Isn't it a beautiful morning this morning? I don't know about you, but it is an absolute blessing for me to get to have the opportunity to sit under pastor's preaching and his teaching and uh, it's a humbling experience to have to follow that but I do appreciate pastor the opportunity to bring the word this morning and uh, I promise it won't take too long we'll see <laughs> If you have your Bibles this morning, if you turn to, to the book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, I feel compelled this morning. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting when, when God starts talking to you about things. And, and a lot of times sermons, I, I don't know what your perception is, but most of the time sermons is uh, come from a place of things that you're dealing with or things that you're learning. And, and, uh, and so it kind of is, is birthed out of a place of, of a desire to learn more and to, to dig deeper yourself. Um, originally, I thought God had had one direction that I, that He wanted me to go with this, and uh, as usual, Pastor was preaching last week, and I, I went off on a tangent in in during that sermon, and 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 started realizing that there were some things that I was unaware of in, on the topic of sonship. I'm not even going to pretend to, to add to what Pastor had to say. I, listen, if you're not in here on Wednesday night uh, and you don't have the opportunity to hear him teach, regardless of the subject, you're really missing out. If, if you enjoy Pastor's preaching on Sunday morning, uh, then uh, you will thoroughly, thoroughly uh, enjoy and get, get so much uh, from his Wednesday night teaching. Uh, but I, I hate that I don't get to sit in here on Wednesday night. I, I can get, pick up snippets of it on Facebook the, the next day, and I try to. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some things about this topic that, that came to light that I just want to share with you this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 12, says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit you put but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if we in, if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together father we thank you for your word we thank you that it is alive that it teaches us we thank you for your holy spirit that aids in that process and interprets your word for us father this morning we pray that your holy spirit would just uh, fill each and every one of us, and that that you would speak into our lives uh, what you would have for us this morning. May your words not fall on anything but fertile ground this morning. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. So there's a few things that I just want to kind of talk through this morning that kind of lay a foundation for, for where I'm going. Uh, 
I want to talk about the idea of adoption. I also want to talk about the concept of heirship and what, what, what that means. But adoption is, is, is a very interesting thing. All right, so we all know what adoption is. Adoption is when you go from being part of one family or to being part of another family. Uh, and that is really something that is done uh, out of the extension of, uh, or of an invitation to be the part of a family. So typically it's not somebody come up, somebody coming to you to ask to be adopted by you, though that does happen, but typically it's the extension by one family to say, listen, I want you to be a part of my family. And we extend that invitation uh, to you. When it talks about God giving us a spirit of adoption, uh, it means that he has extended to us the invitation to be a part of his family. Uh, now, you might say, well, I asked Jesus to come into my life. Well, yes, but he first extended the invitation through his Holy Spirit to be a part of his family. And so it's still the act of the extension of that invitation. When you are adopted into a family, and I, I, I've, I've not been through this process myself, but I've ministered uh, to a lot of youth over the years that were a part of that process. There are some things that, that come into play. It's not always an easy thing. Uh, a lot of times you're going from an environment that maybe lacks some structure or, or maybe is transient in nature, like through the foster care system or something like that, and you're coming into a more structured environment. There's the, the fear of the unknown, not knowing what you're getting into, though, though embracing the idea of being part of a family you don't really know what to expect. And in that process, there are a lot of things that over the course of time uh, you learn. One is your identity within that family. Uh, you don't know what it means to be a Smith or a Jones. You've only known what it meant to be wherever it was that you came from. Uh, the heritage that comes with that family. What does it mean to be that? Now, in our society today, that doesn't always ring true in the same way that it has in the past where uh, there, there is a legacy involved in, 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 in who you are, but that is part of it. What does it mean to be a Smith or a Jones? Sometimes you're coming into an environment where there are other siblings, and those siblings can aid in that process. They can come up alongside of you and say, all right, this is how we do things in our house. This, this, these are the house rules. This is what it means to be a part of our team. This is, this is how, it, how we act. This is how we eat. This is, how we, uh, this is where we go to church. This is how we worship God. All of those things. We learn what the expectations are of the new family. Sometimes that can be a very scary thing. I don't know what they expect from me. In other environments, this was my expectation, and this is how I was treated if I met or did not meet those expectations. But now that whole thing is, is brand new. All of those things are a part of that process. And over the course of time, it, 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 it becomes part of you. Now, each and every one of us has a, has a DNA within us. I, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, made the comment, well, I'm my father's son, or I'm my mother's daughter, or I'm my mother's son. And, and by that, we typically mean that there's some trait or something about us that links us uh, to our parents uh, and links us to what they have passed down to us genetically. Uh, and, and I think here in the South is, what do we say? We come by it honest, right? Is that, is that the term? Uh, and, and you look at somebody and say, well, they're just like their dad. I, I look at Connor uh, and I say, man, he is his daddy uh, all over. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, and, and take that for what you, I mean, he acts like him, he walks like him, he laughs like him, uh, and he's going to be a handful just like his daddy was. Uh, you may look at Seth and, and uh, no, we won't go there. Uh, he's just like his mama. But uh, <laughs> it's funny how that plays into who we are, if it's something that we like about ourselves or about somebody else, we're proud of the fact that we take after that trait in our, in our parent or our family. But if there's something we don't like about ourselves, we also like to blame that on the fact that we had no choice in the matter. 
I really don't like this about myself. I got it from my daddy. You know, it's his fault. It's not mine. I had no choice in the matter. Uh, and and the, big, the, the big controversy of nature versus nurture comes into play there. Uh, but here's what I can tell you about adoption. That sometimes the best part of adoption is that we're no longer being nurtured by our nature. I want that to sink in for just a second. Now, sometimes it, 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 it's not that way. But, but most of the time, we're going into a better environment than when, where we came. And so that nature is no longer the source of what nurtures us. Sometimes it's that nature that uh, failed to nurture us altogether. So I want to talk about what it means to be an heir for just a second. We all have an idea of what that is. Uh, if you're like me, you're not anticipating inheriting much of anything <laughs> in, in a tangible sense. Uh, there's, there's nothing there, all right? I, I, what I have at the end of my life is going to be what I pass along to my son. Uh, I don't expect to get anything, okay? Um, but we think of an inheritance in a very tangible sense. It's, it's money, it's things, it's possessions, it's whatever somebody is going to pass along to us. And we all, I think, at some point in time in our life have, have at least toyed with the idea that maybe there's some long lost relative that really, really does love us, even though we've never met them, and is going to leave a huge fortune to us, uh, unbeknownst to us at this point in time. Uh, if you've lived that, uh, come see me later. I want you to contribute to Speed the Light. Uh, but if not, you're just like me. That person has not surfaced, nor will they ever, right? But inheritance is, is about stuff, okay? now. When we go into, into Scripture and we look at what that meant, inheritance was a very important thing from the very beginning. Uh, many of you who have heard me preach before know that I claim that the book of Judges is my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, Genesis is quickly becoming a, a, a close second. And I never realized the wealth of, of, of information that's there. In, in youth last week, we talked about uh, why... The Bible is the Word of God. And that may seem like a very elementary thing for us to talk about, but it's very, very important and it's foundational. And if we're going to believe anything else that we teach or, um, or read out of Scripture, it's important for us to understand that it is the Word of God. But it, through the course of, of that teaching, uh, and, and I, I throw this out there a lot, especially with youth, because they, there, there's a detachment with Scripture so many times. They look at what's there, and they look at this as a history book, as, as ancient history, as stuff that happened, you know, 2,000, 3,500 years ago that they couldn't possibly relate to because none of those people uh, lived the kind of life that we live today. And honestly, it's not just students or, or, or young adults. I think a lot of us struggle with that sometimes when we go into Scripture and, and we hear a preacher stand up here and say, look, the answer to everything you face in life is right here in Scripture. And we go, that's good to know, but how do I find it? Where do I go? Does anybody else struggle with that sometimes? I mean, I mean, let, let's, let's face it. Just because the book's here and just because it's full of the words, we don't know where to go and, and, and how to make that apply to our lives. We read stories, and a lot of times they're just, they just seem like ancient history. They just seem like, okay, well, God... Okay, there's this Abraham guy, and then God made a promise, and there's all this other, you know, th then he had sons, and they had sons, and it's just one thing after another, and then, oh, there's Jesus, and now we've got this whole other story and narrative that we follow, and we read through that, and we pick out portions of Scripture that speak to us, maybe important verses that, that always tend to be a source of comfort to us, uh, and we go there, but it's really hard to read comprehensively through scripture does anybody else have a struggle with that it, it's hard and so what's a source of comfort to me is this when I go back to a book like Genesis that I can remember from my childhood of being stories in Sunday school and children's church that that speak to me I go back to those stories and those stories come alive in different ways and that there's more to the story than I ever realized and 
the older I get, the more I realize that I can read the same thing over and over again, and it speak to me in a different way. Pastor mentioned last week that, that prophecy is not a, something that he te- preaches on a whole lot, that there are people in our, in our church that that is their, their vein of study, and that's what they focus on. Uh, and we all have that. That's okay. Uh, I want everybody to understand there are certain parts of the Bible that are hard reads for all of us. I, I'm with pastors. Sometimes prophecy, is it, it, it's a difficult thing, especially if I'm tired, to sit down and read. You know, the book of Romans, our text came out of the book of Romans this morning. Anybody ever sat and read, read through the book of Romans? Not an easy read. It, it, you know, it, it's like you've got to chew on every verse to really get what's going on there. But then there are other parts that... That, that tell stories, and, and, and one of the reasons I love the book of Judges is because it's like an epic movie that, that even Hollywood would have a hard time putting together and, and making you believe. I mean, the stuff that happens in there is crazy. Well, some of the stuff in the book of Genesis is the same way. And what I've discovered is, yes, it's the story, it's the beginning, it's creation, it's, it's the Abrahamic covenant, it's the, the story of Joseph that was one of my favorites when I was a kid, but with, with, within all that, there's more to the story. It's kind of a Paul Harvey moment, right? Some of us will get that. But uh, it's the rest of the story. So I want to talk to you about what, why inheritance was important to God from the very beginning. And it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because what do we think of when we think of the person to inherit or, or to be the heir? We always think of the firstborn, right? The firstborn is the most important, right? Right, Jacob? Firstborn. You're the man, right? Firstborn is important. To the, to, so much so that there are stories uh, on multiple occasions in Scripture of twins that are about to be born, and they are very, very uh, precise about how they identify the firstborn because even in a twin situation, the firstborn has certain rights that come along with them that have to be adhered to. It's interesting to realize, though, that as, mu- as much, even when, when the law was given, as much as was given to the firstborn, there was also the a- opportunity to make an exception. It's really, it, it's really interesting because you think, hey, that's the law. That's the law. The firstborn has to get this. And a lot of us, when we, when we think about those rights, we say, hey, that's what I'm due. I'm the firstborn, and therefore, that's what, that's what comes to me. But inevitably, there are more times that we can find where an exception was made, at least in these stories that we read through the book of Genesis. So I want to start with Abraham for just a second here, because this, this is really interesting. If we, go to, um, if we go to Genesis chapter 12, this is, this is the call of Abraham. Now, if we remember the story, all right, Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. God first called his father to go to the land of Canaan. He only made it so far and stopped. And then Abraham picked up from there, and God called Abraham, and it said this. The Lord said to Abram, go out, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot with him. Abraham, Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. All right, he's 75 years old, and he takes his nephew with, you, with him, and this is the first mention of God's call on Abram's life. But nowhere in, that, in this particular call did he mention he would give him a son. I never realized that until reading back through this not too long ago. I've always operated under, under the idea that God called Abraham, said, I'm going to give you a son, I'm going to make you a great nation, and all this. That is not even mentioned until later on in the story. Right here it just says, go, and uh, all the nations of the world will be blessed as a result. And it goes on to say that Abraham believed God, 
and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he goes, and he, and he picks up all his belongings, and he goes, and along with him, his nephew Lot. Now, in, in the culture of the day, it was not uncommon for there to be, uh, uh, to not be a blood heir. So Abraham was 75 years old. He probably had chalked up, hey, I'm not going to have any kids. God's going to make me a great nation, but I'm not going to have any kids, right? But he adopted his nephew, Lot. Here's what's interesting about Lot. Lot was the first prodigal son. If you read the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal son went to his father, and this is New Testament, went to the father and said, hey, I'm done being your son, and uh, I want my inheritance now, and I'm just going to go live my life. Well, it's short-sighted. And I want you to think about, about this. It's just, just kind of a side note about the prodigal. He went early on in dad's career. Now, if you think of this in the sense of an investment portfolio, he withdrew way too soon, okay? He got what dad was worth when dad was young. He didn't want to wait to get what dad was worth when dad was old. Now, in Jewish culture, the older son got how much? double of what? A double portion of all of it. So, prodigal son and brother, the estate would have been split into three sections. Older brother would have gotten half, uh, would have gotten half, and the other one would have gotten one third. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, he got two thirds and a third. But he didn't. He didn't get like. Okay. He, what I'm getting at is, he 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 got. He he didn't just get a double portion because a double portion of two would have been the hundred percent. So he got two thirds, and the brother got, the other brother got a third. So he got the prodigal got a third, of the entire estate, but valued at the value early in the father's lot. Lot did something very similar. Lot was traveling along with Abraham, with Abram at the time. When Lot and Abram had to coexist, I think Lot, and this is just, hey, this is just my speculation. This is not from scripture. I'm just drawing conclusions from some clues that are there. Abraham was promised a whole lot more land than what the Israelites ended up inheriting in the end. All right, it says that from the Mediterranean all the way to the Euphrates River was the promised land. That's modern day Iraq. There was a whole lot more land that had been promised to Abram. But when they got there, Abram looked at Lot and he said, you know what, I don't want us to quarrel. You pick what you want. Take half of what I've got. You can have it. And Lot took the best of the, of, of the land that had been given to Abram. He took part of Abram's inheritance, which tells me Abraham some, or Abram somewhere in his mind had thought Lot may be the mechanism through which his legacy would be extended. Okay? Possibly. Through one of two mechanisms, either the direct heir, which would have ended up not working because he only had daughters, or through giving one of his daughters to Abram's son, should Abram ha have a son later on. So Lot could have been the intended heir in this situation. Later on, we, we go through the story. Uh, Lot takes that. He makes some really, really bad decisions. He gets into a lot of trouble. Abraham has to go bail him out. And God comes to Abram again and says, hey, now I'm going to change your name to Abraham. And uh, I am promising you a son, which he found funny because now he was even older. So Abraham said, all right, well, that's fine. So, uh, and, and it actually came as a result of the fact that he questioned God. He said, God, you're promised me, promising me all of this legacy, but nowhere, uh, the, my only heir is Eleazar of Damascus. All right, now, Eleazar is not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. It's assumed that he is... The, by, by many scholars, that he is the servant that Abraham sends to, to get 
uh, a wife for Isaac. But he said, Eleazar is my intended heir. Now, it was also uh, the case where if uh, a man and woman were childless, they could take a servant and they could offer the birthright to a servant. As long as the servant agreed to fulfill the responsibilities of the birthright. You see, it's not just receiving. On, on our end, we're looking for that rich relative that's just going to leave us everything, right? And, and that, that's the good part about an inheritance. Well, with the birthright, it was more than that. It wasn't you just get stuff. You get stuff and have to do stuff, okay? And I hate to sound really elementary in that, but Eleazar, in order for him to have been the heir, he would have had to enter into an agreement with Abraham and Sarah to take care of them until their death and to take care of their burial, and then to take care of all of their affairs. So basically to become like an executor over their estate in order to inherit that. But Abraham also knew that he was, was a pagan. And God made a promise. He said, do not allow anybody to marry outside of your people. And so that's when God said, hey, uh, I'm going to give you a son. They laughed about it. Sarah had this great idea that she was going to let Abraham have her servant Hagar who was an Egyptian woman they had Ishmael we know where that ended up it's not good we're dealing with it still to till today but Abraham gave up more territory then because God had to honor the legacy of Ishmael and promised that he would live amongst his people which was part of the uh, the inheritance finally Isaac comes along and, and, and we know the rest of, uh, of that story. Isaac uh, was not actually the firstborn of Abraham, but he was the, he received the birthright. Now, here's, here's where I'm going. I, I know some of you are wondering where I'm going with this. I promise we're going to get somewhere. We're going to talk about birthright for just a second. The concept of generational covenant with the concept of generational covenant, inheritance becomes a very important part of life. And we, um, the birthright, and, and this, this is a quote that I found from, from a, a Jewish writer. It says, the birthright thus had to do with spiritual direction, whereas the blessing had to do with material superiority. Okay? So if we bounce ahead to, to Esau and Jacob, we know this story, right? They were twins. Esau was born first. He was a big, burly, hairy guy, and Jacob was a mama's boy who hung out in the tents and, and cooked all day, okay? Nothing wrong with either one of those scenarios, just saying that Esau was a big, burly guy, okay? Matter of fact, he was a hunter, uh, and uh, he had a big, big ego. But the birthright was his, and subsequently, the blessing should have been his as well. But in a moment of weakness, he came into the tent, was starving from being out in the field, and, and his brother, looking for an opportunity, said, hey, I'll give you a, a, a bowl of soup if you sell me your birthright. And he said, what good is my, my birthright if I starve to death? What he, what he also knew was that with the birthright came responsibilities, and he did not want to take on the responsibilities of the birthright, but he knew the blessing was still out there. He knew the stuff was still out there. So he said, hey, look, you, you're here. You hang out in the tents anyway. You're mama's boy. So you hang out in the tents. You take the birthright. You take care of them, and I'll come back for the blessing. Well, we know what happens, right? His father gets old. He can't see. I mean, he must have been really, really blind, because, or, or, or Esau was really this, that hairy. They put goat fur on uh, Jacob, sent him in there. Man, if you feel like a goat, you are a hairy dude. I'm just saying. I, I, I don't get it. But he went in there. He deceived his father. He received the blessing. Now Jacob had the birthright and the blessing. But the distinction there is very important. When I was a kid and, re and heard that story, I always got the two confused. And I thought, well, if he had already sold the birthright, what, what was there to steal? Well, there were two completely different things. The, birth, the birthright was was spiritual direction. They became the headship of the family. They became the one that was giving direction to the family, that, that took on the spiritual, the, the, the priest of the house, so to speak. The blessing was all the stuff, the tangible things that came with the inheritance. There's a very clear distinction between those two. 
Esau did not want the responsibility. Now, I want to talk about airship for just a second. The, the scripture that we talked about this, or, or that we read this morning, it made a distinction that, that we are adopted, first of all, and through that adoption, we become heirs. And as heirs, we become joint heirs with Christ. I tried to find out the instances where that word joint heirs is used, and I tried to figure out the legal ramifications of that because I tried in our society and through our mindset and our worldview today, how would that work if somebody was a joint heir? And the math just doesn't work to be a joint heir because if, if you are the firstborn and you have a double portion and then you have a joint heir that has an equal portion, then it, the math doesn't work. And, I, and, and at first I was willing to say, you know what, God math doesn't work anyway. It's just like tithing, you know. You give 10%, you still have 100, it doesn't make sense. It, you know, and God just says crazy common core math, right? It, but no, it's not. It, it, it's anointed, unlike common core math. Uh, there are four places in the New Testament where the term that is used for joint heirs exists. One is Romans 8.17 that we read this morning. And it says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so, uh, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Ephesians 3.6 says this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, there's that word, and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So in this case, it's not talking about being a joint heir with Christ. It's saying that the Gentiles become joint heirs of God's promise to Israel. Okay? Hebrews 11.9 says this, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Okay? Talking about the heirs of the Abrahamic co covenant. 1 Peter 3.7 says, likewise, husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Talking about husbands and wives together being joint heirs of God's grace. So the only instance where we're talking about being a joint heir with Christ is in Romans 8:17, where it talks about this idea of adoption. So if we're going to put all this back in, into some level of context, here, here it is. Jesus is the firstborn and only born of God. Okay? We all agree on that. That makes him the sole heir of the estate, which gives him not just a double portion, but the whole thing. And if we are a joint heir with Jesus, that gives us 100% of the estate for us. And not just me, but me and Pastor and Miss Diane and everybody in this room. It's everybody, every one of us has 100% of the estate that is given to Jesus as joint heirs. Now, maybe that's not revelation to you, but in my mind, you know, a lot of times I look at this and I go, okay, we're joint heirs with Christ, but, you know, he's still God and he's still Jesus, so that puts me a notch or two below him at least, okay? No, it means we are 100% on the same level as Jesus Christ in the realm of the inheritance that, he, that God is giving us as adopted sons. Is adoption all that important? It is. Dan mentioned at the end of last, last week's service that if somebody in their culture was adopted, they could not be disinherited, unlike a true blood-born son that could be disinherited. In situations where a father chose to give the inheritance to another son, he, he could make that distinction between his sons or completely disinherit one. Let's move forward to, to Jacob for just a second. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, right? His firstborn was who? Anybody remember? Reuben. Reuben messed that up, right? By the law, Reuben should have been, the, had the birthright. But what it, Reuben did, Reuben made a big mistake, right? He, he defiled his father's 
bed, okay? So he said, all right, Reuben's out. Well, then, then who was next? Anybody remember? Huh? Simeon. Not Simeon. <laughs> it was Reuben, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, then Judah. Okay? Simeon and Levi did something. Anybody remember what they did in a fit of rage? It's a really funny story. And I mean, it's, not, it's tragic. But, all right, so they had a sister. All right? And his sister... Uh, some of the guys, the, the, pagan, uh, the pagans around there liked his sister, wanted to marry her. They said, hey, if all of your grown men will get circumcised, uh, we'll give you our sister. Uh, then uh, they did that, and while they were still recovering from the procedure, Simeon and Levi went in the camp and killed 200 of them. Scholars say that they were less than 16 years old when they did that, by the way. So just... There's funny things that play out in my head, but I just imagine these two little ADD teenagers with swords running through there just killing everybody. But Simeon and Levi shed all this blood, and so they did not receive the inheritance. So we're working our way down. Now, on the other side of things, those were Leah's sons. Leah was, was the first wife of Jacob, but through deception, right? He didn't love Leah. He loved Rachel. He worked seven years for Rachel, ended up with Leah, had to work another seven years to get Leah. Okay? Leah's, huh? Rachel, I'm sorry. Leah first, then Rachel. A lot of the names. Uh, who was the firstborn of Rachel? Joseph was. Who, was. who was his favorite? Joseph. How do we know that? He had the coat of many colors. Jacob wasn't too slick in his favoritism, all right? It was pretty blatant. And so here he had the favorite wife that he could justify and say, look, she was what I was, I was deceived, and therefore Joseph is my firstborn. And he gave him the coat of many colors. He elevated him above his brothers. His brothers all hated him because of that. Uh, he fathered, I, I don't know what he was thinking, but sent Joseph off to, to bring him lunch. They said, here comes our brother. Let's kill him. And Reuben stands up and says, don't kill him, don't kill him. Well, that was that actually wasn't Reuben. Reuben said, don't kill him. And Reuben's plan was to take him back to his father and regain his father's favor and regain the birthright. But he, he, go to, he went off to do something, and Judah, who was the next in line for the birthright, he was in contention with Joseph directly for the birthright. Pulls him out and says, let's sell him. Sell him to this band of Ishmaelites that are coming through, and then we'll just tell our father that he was killed. Reuben comes back. He's distraught, not over his brother, but over the fact that now he's got no, uh, nothing to go back to dad with. And uh, then we know the, the story of Joseph. In the end, in the end, Joseph ends up in Egypt. We know the story there. But somewhere right in the middle of that story is this really weird narrative about Judah. Anybody remember this? Judah and Tamar, right? All right, so just really quickly, because this is important. Judah and Tamar. Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law, okay? Judah has three sons. Tamar is married to the oldest son. The oldest son does something evil in the eyes of God. We don't know what it is, and God kills him, okay? So by their tradition, the next brother would have had to grant an heir to his older brother by taking the wife once, okay? He decided he didn't want to do that because he knew he was going to have to give up his double portion. And so he wouldn't do it. And God killed him. Okay? Now, here's where, the, here's where things get kind of crazy. I always looked at this story and thought, man, she, she was a manipulative individual, and she knew what she was doing. And she was, so, so he sent, Judah says, hey, my, my next son in line is not old enough to get married. So go back to your father's house and live as a widow until he's of age. And she goes, 
And evidently, he had become of age, and Judah did not fulfill his part of the bargain. And so she finds out Judah's traveling through. She dresses like a prostitute, stands on the side of the road, and, wind, and, and he winds up paying for her services. And, um, and then she winds up pregnant. He wants her killed because of it. Uh, she had been bailed at the time, and she produces what he gave as collateral because he wasn't carrying cash. Didn't have his debit card. Uh, so um, she's like, hey, uh, I, I'll, you, you can kill me, but you got to kill the person that belo- these belong to. And Judah's like, uh-oh, <laughs> those are mine. Now, it sounds like she did something really conniving there. But as I dug into it some more, here's the thing. Through that same arrangement with the sons carrying on the legacy of the daughter-in-law, a father-in-law had the responsibility to step in and produce the heir for the oldest son if there were no other brothers. And he refused to. He refused to do his duty, and so she forced the issue with him. The result of that was another set of twins and the firstborn became the ancestor, the direct ancestor of King David. Judah, if we go back into the book of Genesis, uh, towards the end of Jacob's life, he's giving his blessings uh, to all of his sons. Judah, become, Judah and Joseph together earned the birthright for the nation of Israel. Now, through the legacy of Judah came all the kings, and later on, Christ. And through Joseph, it became some of the leadership through his uh, two sons. This is what's interesting about that. Joseph had no direct inheritance in the land of Israel. We remember this, right? He had two sons because Joseph had an Egyptian wife. Anytime that there was a, a... a pagan wife, there was a sidestep to the legacy, and God would do something else. So Jacob, we, we look at that and say, well, J- Jacob just blessed his two grandsons. He didn't. It says he actually adopted them. He said, I take them as my own. And so Jacob actually adopted Joseph's two sons and gave them the inheritance, the birthright that was due to Joseph. All right, so we we just walked through the whole book of Genesis. I'm sorry, that stuff. Maybe it doesn't. May, maybe it's not as interesting to you as it is to me. But I I see the sovereignty of God through all of this. I see that God had a plan from day one, and that no matter what men did to mess that up, because let's face it, Abraham was a righteous man. His righteousness came from his belief in God, his belief that God would bless him not because he just walked uprightly. He was a mess of a human being. I mean, he got his wife into situations that were just crazy. You need to read the story. He passed her off as his wife twice. And, um, sister. He passed his wife off as his sister twice. And, um, you know, the whole situation with Hagar, the you know, all of that was just a mess. But every time that man would make a decision in their free will to do something outside of God's will, God's sovereignty still stood. And he said, you know what, I'm going to honor my covenant, but we're going to do this just a little bit different. And we're going to look not to the lineage that men look at. We're not going to look at your firstborn and just say, hey, just because you're the firstborn, all right, you messed up, but we've got to go that route. No, God said, you know what, there's another alternative here, and we're going to sidestep because my will is going to be done in the end of all this, no matter what you decide to do. As adopted sons, we could be named as heirs to the kingdom. We could even be named ahead of natural-born heirs in certain circumstances. But Romans 8.17 declares that we are joint heirs with Christ. And we've already talked about the fact that he has 100% airship. And that gives us 100% airship. But here's, here's one, one thing 
that I've not mentioned about this. Upon a father's death, his heirs could divide the estate immediately or they could keep it intact for a time, perhaps while waiting for a younger son to come of age. Why is this important? Because I believe that that's the age that we're living in now. A few weeks ago, I shared, uh, I shared something with you, with you guys that uh, uh, we heard at youth convention, and that was with all the emphasis on, on end time prophecy and all the craziness that's going on in the world, we've, we shift our focus to uh, all this bad stuff is happening, so the end must be near. All this bad stuff is happening, so the well, to some degree, that's 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 a fact. I mean, we're we're, we're given those prophetic. Uh, images so that we know when the end is near but our focus should not be on hey Jesus is coming back when things get bad enough the focus should be Jesus is coming back when his bride is ready enough okay it's not it, we're not waiting for things just to get bad enough and I think so many times now the church is sitting on pews waiting on things just to get bad enough and going all right it's getting closer it's getting closer all right, Jesus, come back. No, instead of being out there making ready the bride. The inheritance in Jewish culture did not have to be divided immediately, which, bring, which, which allows us to make sense of this 100%. You see, I can be a joint heir with Christ. You can be a joint heir with Christ. 20 billion people can be joint heirs with Christ as long as the estate is never fulfilled as long as it's not brought to fruition. We're all making ready the estate. This is where it gets really good. Go back to Jewish law. One person is left out of this whole equation. Ladies, you're not going to like this. The wife. Larry Ray. I hope he lives till he's 150, all right? But let's just say he doesn't. Anita, if you were living in ancient Ju Judah, Nick and uh, Zach, they're the heirs. You don't get anything because you're just the wife. I I'm not saying that because that's how I think, but that's just how it was, okay? When a... And a daughter, a daughter doesn't get anything. A daughter was, was a possession, and a daughter was given to somebody else in marriage. And, but here's, here's the crazy thing. When a daughter was given in marriage, she relinquished any claim to her previous family, and she became part of the estate of the new family. Is anybody following where I'm going with this? All right, so we're adopted. We, we leave an old family behind, and we're, we become part of the new family. We, we assume an identity. But when we marry into that family, we do exactly the same thing. And in Scripture, it says that Christ is returning for his bride. We are holding the estate. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are supposed to be preparing it to come to fruition. We are supposed to be preparing the estate to be divided and to prepare that bride that will become the inheritance in the end. I don't know about you, but I become more and more aware each and every day of my life that I'm doing way too little in the realm of preparing the bride of Christ. I think that we become, I become very lazy. I become lazy on account of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not given to us for us to be lazy. And what I mean by that is this. Wonderful. You just gave your heart to Jesus. God has sent his Holy Spirit to live in you. That Holy Spirit will teach you and 
will convict you of the things in your life that are wrong and will will lead you through his word uh, and interpret those things that need to be interpreted to you that will give you revelation. They'll give, the Holy Spirit is a source of giftings and callings. It's a source of healing. Have a great Christian life. And that's what we do. And then when something goes wrong and, and, and something, something in their life might, might be going off on a tangent, we go, hey, they knew better. They got the same Holy Spirit I do. Now, now listen, there, there is a difference, all right? The Holy Spirit can convict people of something that our job is not to convict people. Our, our job is to disciple them. Our job is to help them. To, to, to point them in the right direction. We, we work alongside the Holy Spirit, but we never work in place of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we can't rely simply on, on the Holy Spirit to do everything because sometimes they don't know. A new believer doesn't know if it's the Holy Spirit or not. I had somebody tell me one time who had been discipled by somebody in the church, well, the, the way I know if something's of God or not is if it pops into my head and it's good, it must be with God. Well, no, there's good stuff that pops into your head that's not necessarily God speaking to you. Don't blame every random thought on God or on the Holy Spirit. But what I am saying is this. We can introduce somebody to Jesus. We can explain to them how the Holy Spirit works in their life and to understand the sensitivity of that Holy Spirit and to listen to that Holy Spirit. But we are still human beings. And, and, and here's where I think that, that, that we mess up. We, we get somebody, we, we, we do a really good job of getting somebody to the altar. We can do a really good job of creating an environment where somebody understands that they need God in their life. But the reality is this, nobody, nobody can be saved unless the Holy Spirit convicts them. Nobody. We, we, all we can do is present the gospel. All we can do is, is, is have that environment. And when I say environment, I'm not talking about smokes and li- smoke and lights and music and uh, certain types of music or anything like that. What I'm talking about is we, we lay the word out and we plow that ground and we make sure that ground is fertile and, and, and give an opportunity for them to hear clearly from the Holy Spirit and to make a decision. But from there, it's our job to come up alongside somebody and walk with them. It's if we're truly joint heirs, you see, that levels the playing field. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're all elevated to that level. We're all walking together. Now, God did, never, never called us because we were already ready to follow him. He called us because we needed him in our lives. We don't have all the answers. We, I, I've seen people throughout the years that have been called from very different places in their lives, whether it's from a corporate office somewhere or from the bar. And it doesn't matter. They come from a different environment. They, they may not understand certain things. It's our job to disciple them. What's that mean to disciple? That's one of those big Christianese words, right? We throw it around a lot, but do we really know what it means? It's kind of a scary word if you really think about it. Jesus had disciples. So is that people that fought 12 dudes that are going to follow me around? I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want the responsibility, and it's kind of creepy. But no, it, that's not what it is. It's, it's teaching somebody. It's taking you some, some, somebody else along the same path that you went, helping them along so that they understand what their role is as this joint heir. We throw that word around a lot. What does it mean? What does it mean for you to be a joint heir? What, it, what entitlement does that give you? Here's the thing that we forget is that with that birthright comes responsibility. It's not just I get my get out of hell free card. It's not that I just I, I get something from God. It's that I now have a responsibility to do something for him. I have the responsibility to make sure that his estate comes to fruition. I have a a responsibility to make sure that others that are being born in and adopted into this family know what their role is. Just like that sibling of an adopted child comes alongside of them and says, this is what it means to be a Smith or a Jones. This is what it means to be one of us. These are, are, are the rules that we follow. 
The, this, is, this is how you serve the family. This is how you live out the legacy. That is our job as, as joint heirs in this adopted situation. None of us were natural born citizens. None of us were natural born heirs to this kingdom. We were all adopted. And we all have to teach each other where we need to go. I'm not going to give you every situation that I feel is, is, is important, but I will say this. Relationship is everything. If, if you work with us at all in youth ministry over the last few years, that has been the resounding core value, if you want to call it that, has been relationship. Everything else, not, not, there are other things that matter, but the core of everything is relationship. It's because with relationship comes responsibility. If I'm going to call you my friend, and you're going to call me your friend, I have responsibilities. Not to just echo everything that you want me to echo in your life, but to also let you know when something in your life is messed up. But it takes, it takes relationship.